uma palestra, do ciclo de palestras da disciplina Urbanismo Sustentável, aqui da pós-graduação da FAO NB, é, dessa vez convidando a professora Heidi Tankey. É, vou apresentar a professora, a palestra de hoje vai ser em inglês, e espero que vocês aproveitem e participem. Ok. Uh, professor Heidi Tanke, you presented the lecture Water Sensitive Urban Design. Professor Tanke is, a direct, is the director of the Landscape Architecture Department at Istanbul Technical University and the founding director of Habitat Ecology Technology, an Istanbul based landscape and urban design firm. She was a Fulbright visiting scholar at Harvard University Graduate School of Design between 2019 and 2021. Her professional interests include landscape ecology and its reflections on design, climate change, and adaptation strategies for future cities. She focuses her practice on promoting healthy human and nature relationships in all types of urban, rural, natural, historical, and cultural landscapes. Her broad range of interests is driven by the challenges resulting from rapidly growing metropolitan areas in developing countries. It's a pleasure to receive you, Professor Heidi. Uh, please, Tiago, you can start the, our, our event. Thank you, Professor Caio Silva. And uh, once again, Professor Heidi Tanke, thank you very much for uh, accepting our invitation to our cycle of lectures. Um, as we discussed it previously, um, you can feel free to share your presentation right now. And afterward, we have like the discussion here with the students in class here in Zoom. And also with the questions that we arise in YouTube, I'll be monitoring that. Professor, once again, thank you very much. You're, feel free to start whenever you want. Thank you very much uh, for this very nice introduction uh, and thank you very much for this warm welcome. And I really hope to be there in person one day. Uh, Brazil is the country that I haven't visited yet. Uh, and I am uh, very much anxious to visit that beautiful geography, uh, which is very much different than where I'm coming from. Um, as the professor says, I'm from Turkey, which is a arid Mediterranean uh, landscape. Uh, very historic one, uh, as you all know, uh, but dealing with um, typical uh, challenges of climate change. Um, it's a lot of climate crises, uh, the, the crisis stemming from the climate change. So the center of the presentation is therefore uh, the, the, the water sensitive uh, urban design in such geographies. Uh, regardless of the amount of the water or the regardless of uh, uh, the, 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 the type of the problems, uh, we all have to deal with similar issues like unpredictable water uh, uh, patterns, unpredictable uh, migration patterns, very uh, highly increasing heat island effects and increasing uh, temperatures uh, all over the world and also uh, the decrease of the biodiversity and uh, and also uh, the wildlife and habitats, especially in urban areas, because those challenges are forcing cities to be more creative when it comes to the water sensitive designs, because the water is a critical issue. It becomes more critical and more scarce or more uh, abundant uh, in terms of the urbanism, climate change and water trajectories. And uh, therefore, it's an imperative to deal with climate uh, crisis in the 21st century. Water is imperative uh, to solve. Um, I'm going to start a video. Uh, this is a, a rainy day uh, a, a month, a month and a ago in Istanbul. And this is what the uh, inhabitants of Istanbul dealing. Um, so this is a rainy day again. Um, just imagine me uh, just trying to go to the public transportation from my home to the uh, metro station. And this is the wheel, uh, unfortunately, that I have to just uh, jump over and look, uh, look towards and, um, and also deal with. 
what we are seeing over here is actually a resource uh, being wasted by the uh, unsustainable urban development, which is relying on gray infrastructure. Therefore, we have all the grades collecting all these water and then this wonderful resource of rainwater, the storm just goes uh, all the way down uh, towards the city in, an, uh, in a great infrastructure. So considering the increasing frequency and the effects of disasters and shocks, uh, this could have been even worse, the, the picture, creating livable cities is an indispensable phenomenon. Uh, and for this reason, many cities have to deconstruct and question their relationship with water during the planning and design stages. So we have to question our dependency on the gray infrastructure while uh, we have these beautiful uh, nature-based solutions coming with the green infrastructure uh, idea. So therefore, I wrote a book. Uh, it, it is in Turkish. This is the cover of the book. It says water sensitive uh, urbanism. Um, just for the, the, the images, uh, which is uh, very nice. And I have to thank my students for that. Uh, then you can just download the, the, the book from the web page that I was I mean, I'm indicating below. So um, I, I wrote a book because um, the urbanization uh, of Turkey uh, does not fully consider the potential of uh, utilizing uh, such resource. Uh, but the cities are complex socio-ecological systems and in cities uh, where the natural and built environment is in harmony, uh, the social, physical, economic conditions support each other sustainably. Uh, this is the, uh, the, the, the picture from uh, Boston uh, where Professor Silva and I had spent uh, a, a, a quite a time. Uh, and th 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 this is the coexistence of nature uh, and uh, human and artifice. Uh, together. And uh, living in a healthier environment, in such environment, positively affects the economic, ecological, and social structure of the city. And uh, the water is an indispensable element of life, actually, in such cities, in healthier environments. And, uh, and the design of the water uh, in the urban design sense uh, is even uh, more important than ever um, in the environment because again, climate change, its pattern is so unpredictable and sometimes it's so hard to uh, understand that pattern. Um, actually, there has been a clear paradigm shift last 50 years to manage runoff of the water in, in cities. Um, the previously, the cities were depending on the gray infrastructure, just like I show you, we are still depending on, and a lot of cities around the world is depending on the gray infrastructure. Uh, but then in the, uh, the urban runoff management realm, there is a shift actually. Uh, in the previous times, uh, the, the water was seen as a, uh, as a waste, as something that we need to get rid of, something that we need to be scared of, and something that we have to control. Uh, but um, the later, uh, that paradigm shift uh, has uh, enabled uh, the cities to understand the water as a resource and see it as a, 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 a wonderful opportunity for bringing vitality to the cities, for meeting the needs uh, of the citizens and also creating sustainable solutions. Um, and so therefore in the green infrastructure uh, point of view, that water is a source rather than a waste and something to be controlled and scared of. Um, and with the paradigm shift, uh, there were a lot of terminologies and approaches uh, emerged in, in around, around the world, actually. These terminologies sometimes 
only emphasize the geographical differences. And sometimes they differ in terms of their subject that they emphasize. Uh, but uh, starting from the 1980s and, in, and mostly in 1990s, uh, with the rapid development of uh, approaches, the different types of approaches, we are seeing best management practices, alternative techniques, or water sensitive urban design. Um, and then these, uh, especially the first two, are more of the site specific and water specific. And then later on during the, 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 during the time, uh, the cities has understood that this is a more of a city scale um, topic, the issue, and then it deserves a citywide solution. And therefore, the terminologies or the approaches were expanded to include larger scale dynamics of the cities. And those terminologies are sustainable urban drainage systems or low impact development. Um, this is a map of all these terminologies coming from different uh, geographies of the world, uh, but all focusing on the same phenomena of water. Uh, with the increasing effect of climate change in the cities, during the 2000s and heavy and sudden rains and long-term droughts affecting daily life and the economy more than ever, the concept of sponge cities emerged from China in 2013. Um, uh, the sponge city emphasizes the importance of permeability to increase the resiliency of the cities. So that permeability aspect uh, does not only imply the water sensitivity, but also uh, brings the arguments of biodiversity enhancement, uh, protection, and uh, preserving the integrity of the landscape and landscape performance. So it has so many uh, different meanings underneath that umbrella concept. Uh, and later, um, and we have the uh, porous city, uh, which is uh, coming from the Thailand, where the water level is constantly rising. And then the, the too much of the water is a problem. So depending on the geography, either it's too, uh, it is a lot or it scares. Uh, everyone is developing their own strategy. Under these headings, examples that transform lost rivers, wetlands, forests, macro and micro scale urban spaces into socially inclusive spaces by considering water and biodiversity factors are becoming widespread all over the world. Um, and uh, the Darable has a hypothesis it is cities are shaped by the difficulties that they have to deal with. So in the one sense, although we see the climate change and its uh, challenges as a negative aspect, which is actually <laughs> negative, but as the designers, we have to focus on how are we going to turn the, the table uh, to our side and then make things much better. So as a designer, it is a, a very exciting brief coming with that challenge. Um, in order to take a comprehensive, comprehensive look at, at the relationships uh, cities have with water and the nature, first we need to have the consensus about uh, the, the city's position, what it provides to us. Because usually in the academical uh, researches, the articles, the professional work everywhere, we have this kind of like a bad attitude towards cities because we always blame the cities for being not livable, for polluting the environment, for uh, not being so inclusive, so and so forth. Maybe those arguments are right, but we need to understand from a water point of view is the fact that cities have access to different scales and types of water. I mean, in the nature, we have the rainwater and then we have the seas, the salty water, which is 75% of Earth. Uh, but in the cities, we have all these like wastewater, gray water, uh, anything that is used and can be reused. So we have different sources of water in the city. So water is, although on the one side, it is a consumption uh, consuming arena, but on the other side, if we are creative to reutilize that waters, it is a resource. Uh, 
So the built environment, uh, which is usually blamed for the, the carbon uh, and, uh, and all types of uh, unwanted effects, uh, actually can both support nature and complement the natural environment. It doesn't have to be that way. It's all up to us as the designers to, to make it better. Um, and uh, another um, point, uh, if the decision makers and the public in the cities have a sensitive approach to water and the awareness is high among the, uh, the, the decision makers and the users, there's a socio-political capital in the name of sustainability. So that socio-political capital is the crucial thing in order to start this process. Otherwise, uh, we all have to uh, deal with all these like negative aspects or anything that will stop us from acting on. Uh, we will just use the economy as, a, as an excuse not to start. We will use uh, the, the regulations, the lack of regulations as an excuse for not to start. Uh, but as long as there is a socio-political capital, it is the, 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 the true and sincere belief of the people uh, that we can just conquer this problem. That is, a, that, that is an important uh, starting point. So we have to, with our designs and with our writings and, and work, we have to support that socio-political capital. Our responsibility is beyond that physical uh, creation of the space. So we have to be designer of this sociopolitical uh, realm uh, or, the, or the background. And the green infrastructure provides a wide range of social, economic and ecosystem services by the cities, uh, for the cities. Uh, it reduce, reduces the dependence on gray infrastructure and comprehensively integrates uh, the, the, the plant and designed natural, semi-natural, elements in the city. So when we look at the city, we have a lot of options actually uh, to uh, manage all these climate and water in a more sustainable way. And we just need to look at the city in a more um, passionate and, uh, and, and much more warmer uh, lenses. Uh, because for example, when it comes to these highway corridors, Actually, those highway corridors, even though in the uh, landscape ecological sense, they might create this barrier, but at the same time, because of the, all the impervious surfaces of that asphalt road, uh, the, 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 it is an excellent source of water that we can collect and harvest. And uh, for example, those uh, huge medians uh, of the highways and then just like, like the um, juxtaposition of huge uh, highway uh, routes. And they are actually excellent sources, incredible patches that we can uh, deal with the urban runoff. Uh, these are the arenas. I mean, we have to look at them as idols. We, we should stop looking at them actually idle spaces, but we should see them as opportunities. Similarly, uh, all these street corridors are the, the water coming from the streets can be directed into the bioswales or uh, small basins that will collect all the water from coming from the neighborhoods. Um, and uh, the, the cities with the hills, uh, which is Istanbul, <laughs> uh, are creating excellent opportunities to collect the water naturally coming from those slopes. And if we create those urban parks, not only in the coastal areas, not only along the river corridors, but at the bottom of those slopes, uh, we have uh, be beautiful uh, and naturally and really low cost way of harvesting the water in the cities and supporting the permeability uh, to natural water cycle in the cities is important uh, because we not only have to collect everything, we don't have to do that because the nature needs that water, we have to release some of them and therefore we need permeability to send the water uh, and filter the water. And that infiltration is so important for the vitality of the wildlife. 
and for uh, the, the future uh, sustainability in the cities, as well as supporting the water cycle uh, on the earth, because uh, the rain has to come and it has to infiltrate, and then some of it has to be uh, received by the plant material, and then some of it will evaporate, and there is this natural cycle. As soon as the city comes to the scene, that cycle is broken, but with this green infrastructure, we can uh, support that cycle back. So therefore, all these things actually, although we were looking at the things, talking about the things in the citywide scale, actually these principles are good for any kind of scale, considering a really small site scale, street scale, even the human scale landscapes. For example, um, creating these large urban streets and plazas or squares with the green, green canopies, with the balconies, uh, not only supports that evapotranspiration or infiltration, but also help us to just um, capture some of the rain, rain, rainwater runoff. For example, a single mature jacaranda tree holds 20 cubic meters of water annually and just consider it a, a thousand of them in the city. And there is this huge water uh, holding uh, mechanisms that we have in the cities, which is providing a shade, which is helping us to feel more comfortable in the hot uh, summer days, uh, and also uh, which is helping us to sequester uh, carbon uh, more than anything. So uh, these are all vital elements to create these live streets and uh, which can be added uh, with the stores and restaurants and exhibition areas, workshop areas, just the hangout spaces. So just bringing that social layer with the design, through the design, uh, with the natural elements together makes the, the design with nature, which is a term coined by Ian McCark uh, in, in the late 1960s. So um, the, the reduction of the unwanted effects of runoff is possible with the design. Uh, and while doing that, we are also supporting the active life and livelihood of the, of the urban environments. And uh, there are principles which is uh, good for every geography on earth. Uh, for example, protecting natural areas as much as possible, minimizing the impact of construction on the hydrology. We don't have to scrape off everything and then change the hydrology, natural hydrology on the side if we are sensitive designers. Um, so, Shaping the land, taking into account the rate and duration of the runoff is a, a critical design parameter. Uh, if you wanna design a water sensitive uh, urban environments. So we have to know the amount and the pattern of the runoff. Uh, and then we have to design with that amount. Uh, employing uh, integrated management practices over the land uh, will help us to collect, store, uh, evaporate, infiltrate the water. So there are many different functions uh, of that uh, rainwater management comes with that um, uh, approach. And, um, and of course, we have to organize training programs to prevent pollution and provide appropriate management. Um, so how are we going to create these lively urban environments, not only inside the city, but also in the coastal areas? Uh, so the coast is an ecological corridor. Uh, creating these continuous coastal green line is important. And I'm sure you have these fascinating beaches, beaches in, in, in Brazil. And, um, and everyone is there. And it's as a high impact area during the summertime. And, and why, while it is social hub of the city, uh, how are you going to uh, maintain the integrity of that green system and, and, and the water uh, more specifically? So the water 
could create this framework for city to manage its green spaces, coastal spaces. Uh, so while on, and on one side, the designers are creating those pedestrian paths and sun decks or, uh, or, or creating some um, areas for socializing along the coast, uh, the, the, the materials, the natural materials or permeable materials are helping that program to act as a efficient, high performing landscape, which is uh, creating microclimate and preserving the erosion and making these smooth uh, transition from urban to the sea, from terrestrial to the aquatic systems. That uh, harmonious transition, the, the, the passage from uh, the harsh urban environment to the uh, water system, the, the, the sea ecosystem is crucial. Uh, so the, 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 the water sensitive design is helping us to do that. And uh, in order to create that uh, transition from the hardcore urban to the uh, natural coast or uh, and a more natural uh, urban landscape, uh, we need to reduce the runoff, of course, uh, because uh, there are a lot of benefits of reducing runoff in the city. Uh, runoff uh, changes the flow of streams, increases flooding, causes erosion in stream corridors, reduces water quality, uh, if we drink such water and if in some way that water is mixed with the, uh, the, the potable water, it causes uh, disaster to the society. Uh, or uh, if we release them directly to the sea, the seafood consumption uh, can be hazardous. Uh, if this, the, 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 the material coming from the sea is uh, polluted, it's possible that it will uh, create this uh, unwanted uh, health hazards for the human beings and also uh, for the other species in aquatic systems. Uh, th th therefore, we need to reduce the runoff in the cities and reducing the runoff depends, in, depends on a sensitive design and all these images that I am showing you uh, is not only for creating livable urban environments, and, uh, but also uh, they are for uh, reducing urban runoff. Therefore, we can increase the livability of the urban environment. It's more comfortable. People can walk freely without dealing with the flood. They, their home will not be flooded and then uh, they, they won't be drowned in the flood or uh, and, uh, and the, the plant materials or other things will not be hazardous uh, for them. So um, the, the, these plant materials are incredible things actually, um, not from only from a carbon point of view or creating microclimate point of view. They have a capacity to reduce and slow down the rain and then rain uh, runoff. Uh, so for example, a mature evergreen tree retains approximately 15 uh, cubic meters of water. So just imagine how much water that is slowing down before it uh, directly goes to the uh, gray infrastructure or the river, river corridors that will not carry the load and then will create the flood. So it's, it's, it's a wonderful uh, reduction opportunities. So um, we need to see the cities and the design of the city environments uh, from the, the water point of view. How are we going to reduce the amount of the runoff? How are we going to create these green and lush environments so the water is not wasted, but it is a resource uh, for ecological rejuvenation and then the social uh, connections and inclusion. Um, and if the city is not doing that, they fight with the water. Uh, so cities has to adapt themselves uh, to these waters. Uh, the adaptation is a, a really critical word that you've been hearing it uh, uh, because we are more and more discussing the resilient cities, how to make the cities more resilient resilience so that adaptability is important adaptability starts with the acceptance of what the water 
how the water behaves. Uh, and if we adapt ourselves and if we uh, uh, design with, uh, with the water, uh, we can manage our rural uh, and waste management much easily. And we can uh, deal with the removal of industrial pollutants in more uh, economically and ecologically efficient way and also energy efficient too. Uh, and uh, if we do not fight with the rivers, uh, the water, I'm sorry, we can uh, restore the rivers much easily and protect the source, the water that uh, is, is, is the essential for the life on earth. Uh, and if we do not fight with water, but design with the water, we can filter the agricultural non-point sources of pollutants. And we can create these biological sewage treatment systems. Uh, and, and, and instead of relying on these mechanical uh, treatment facilities, which requires millions and millions of dollars, and then, uh, and then they have a life cycle, we have this uh, in infinite possibility with the nature, uh, which will cost uh, almost nothing once we establish the system. So all these um, nature and artifice connection in the city uh, can be re-evaluated from the water point of view, because we can see the water as a design medium, as a design motivation, as a design input, it's a brief for us. I mean, there, there, there is this problem coming with that and that is the brief there. And, uh, and then the water is the source and also the regulator of the environmental conditions. So it's an environmental asset. And um, water is socio-ecological systems as you are seeing in the image here, uh, there is this really aggressive urban with the metro subway systems underneath, the, 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 the below ground parking spaces and then the, the, the shopping malls and then all these like high skyscrapers or the housing and then commercial units. And then on top of that, there are uh, roof gardens and all the efforts to keep this system going. So we, 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 this is the driver. The water could be the driver of sustainable de development. And then it could uh, create this framework uh, through which we can see the green. So this is the quote from uh, Gerrit Doherty of Harvard University. So um, with that, uh, I would like to show you some examples. So, so as a designer, how do I get my motivation from the water? How is the water is, it, is an input in my designs? And how is the, 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 uh, the, the source of the whole concept? So I will show you some examples from the works that we did in Istanbul. And, in, and we have been continuing still in that uh, mission. Um, as you can see over here, this is uh, very much like a, a car oriented uh, open space uh, where uh, the, the, the green space next to it does not have any kind of um, program or any way of we are just utilizing it uh, for the people um, using the site or passing by the site. Uh, and and, and even uh, in some areas are highly compacted. So the permeability is out of question here in this landscape. And then just keeping the lawn green uh, is uh, not energy efficient. It's a lot of effort to keep the green going. And, uh, and then also uh, the, the situation of the trees um, are, um, although they are creating these shade and nice environments, uh, there should be uh, some uh, alternatives for people to come here and mingle together. Um, just a simple, simple consideration of using uh, just a water sensitive, low water usage, local and native species can change the whole atmosphere. This is the, uh, the same uh, area, the compacted soil area, where the, uh, the, the, the sidewalk was uh, next to it. And then it was not too much of a comfortable walk because on the one side, we had the compacted soil and on the other side, we had the asphalt road. And 
this can this can change actually this can change to include all these native species flourishing beautifully uh, without uh, adding extra amount of irrigation to the landscape these are all mediterranean native species not only that the inclusion of the bicycle system and then making that bicycle surface in a permeable uh, asphalt uh, makes the the, the water uh, even uh, more uh, uh, important in the design. I mean, it's, it's in the front of the design that water concentration has brought all these uh, elements of native species and using permeable materials. And uh, of course, that area uh, is utilized uh, by uh, uh, significant amount of people now because they can they have and an opportunities to just uh, come together and sit down and relax and study together read together eat together or um, because we get rid of the traffic and it's a more pedestrian way right now with the more of the bicycle uh, friendly environments uh, people can uh, act uh, freely and uh, and also uh, just uh, keeping up with the maintenance uh, with the new design which is encouraging the native species and the permeability and the, the social uh, aspects of the uh, of the landscape design uh, is is much much easier and more effective um, another example which is a typical um uh, so situation uh, in, in Turkey, we have the building, uh, unfortunately looking towards the west, which is taking a lot of sun in the afternoon time. And just imagine all these ACs, uh, air conditioning units hanging on the uh, individual windows, just working all day long, especially in the hot afternoons because the, the, the facade is facing uh, west. And, and, and then also imagine the heat island effect uh, and then all these reflected heat coming from the parking surfaces in this area and it's again this is a car oriented approach and people would like to just park right in front of their work and uh, but then how about socializing and being a community the work community the school community neighborhood community and how about uh, dealing with even more heat in the future due to the climate change and uh, the, the, the heating of the, the global heating. How are we going to tackle that? And can the, uh, can, can the space uh, be much more inclusive with the small touches? Uh, because sometimes we have the limitation of like uh, under underneath of this space is the uh, so sometimes it could be a parking space and sometimes it could be a, a, a some uh, form of space in the building space that's utilized and we cannot put extra load or uh, and uh, extra uh, materials we do not have that soil depth in that case those small touches like getting rid of all the borders so that the, the water coming from those hard surfaces directly go into the inside of these green patches, uh, which is uh, arranged to hold the water and um, and creating these um, again the, the the areas where people can sit and uh, and communicate with each other are small touches and then just putting some panels to reduce the heat coming from the west and uh, and uh, something um, some some vegetation and some canopies to create this microclimate is, 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 is essential uh, this is another typical situation. So we had the example with the buildings and then we have the examples of without the buildings. It is as if you look at it, this is an abandoned land, uh, which may cause some problems during the nighttime for, uh, for, for, uh, for people to use. Uh, it's kind of a, a abandoned and uh, um, dark area. Um, but how are we going to utilize this, this space uh, again for um, 
water collection and uh, social uh, connection uh, and also uh, the, the, the rehabilitation of the whole environment uh, in, 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 in a more sustainable way. So when we had to do that, uh, we, we had to deal with the accessibility of the site. So in such areas where the accessibility is a problem in the urban environment, we have this situation very common. So there is this road due to this really high slope uh, there, there is uh, the, the, the people will never be able to get inside of this area. And then because it's abandoned and nobody is there, some unwanted and illegal uh, behaviors occurs during the, um, the night time or the, the quiet times. So the, as, a, as a designer, the brief was really clear and then uh, the, 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 the point was to just allow accessibility to the site without sacrificing any trees here. But when we had to do that, which means expanding the slopes towards the, these green space, so that people can just walk down directly, uh, even with the disabled people, that slope has to be adjusted so that it, even they might go inside of this green, nice area. Uh, but we, if we had to do that, we had to sacrifice the trees. Uh, and then because we have to bury the trees almost like halfway. Um, so without sacrificing the trees, opening up the space for accessibility in a, a, a permeable way so that that permeability and then the, 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 whatever the structure we are doing is also helping to collect water uh, was a very uh, complex uh, uh, and but exciting uh, input uh, to the design. So we decided to just uh, utilize these uh, urban rooms, the, the, the green rooms, what we call it. Uh, so we had the slope of 5%. Uh, everybody was able to walk inside of these green spaces. And, and then the structures uh, that we located uh, underneath of each tree was helping uh, to collect the water and then direct it to the roots of the plants. And, uh, and with that room, uh, the, the, the people utilizing the space were able to see the design, not, well, see the nature actually eye to eye. So it was kind of like bringing the artifice and the nature together for the human being. So when you're inside those rooms, actually, you are eye to eye with the nature, which is something that we don't get to experience much in the city environments. I mean, even though we go to the parks and green spaces, we never lay down and look at the plants uh, in, in such way and, and see the bugs going there. I and mean, the kids does, not the grown-ups, but um, the, these structures, again, just allowing uh, the, the water collection as well as the people's utilization of the space that canopy underneath that canopy and spending time and just listening the birds and just reading your book or just resting and listening your uh, uh, iPhone is just uh, fantastic. Um, and uh, again, the space, uh, when you just make it accessible, it brings the people for social connections. So it's not only an ecological connections related with the water and the biodiversity, but human as a species belong to that habitat is also thriving in that. So it's again, nature and artifice coming together to create this um, be, be beautiful, uh, very peaceful environments. And what I really like about this is the fact that even though we have all these like complex um, parameters to tie with, uh, when you look at the design from a distance, it just looks like there is not much. And it's just, it does not direct you. It does not um, impose anything on you. It is uh, flexible and open. And during the nighttime, of course, we have the rooms illuminated so we can even utilize it during the night time too and and sometimes in the design just the elevation of just one single tree which is an oak tree here what you are seeing 
is just seeing the design just from that point of view, just feeling yourself as a rainwater drop or seeing yourself as an oak tree, just standing on the side for a really, really long decades. So you, 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 you have a right to direct the whole design. You have a right to uh, uh, the, 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 just to sketch the ideas, shape the ideas, because you've been there for many, many decades and you survived, even though the conditions were really harsh. So we have to, as the designers, we have to salute that attitude. And then we have to be, be really, really creative, even though the function, the nowadays function, the current function, um, requiring that we have to, okay, this is a football field, we need, uh, uh, we need some kind of arrangements surrounding this field uh, so that people will sit there and cheer up for their team. So there is this structure has to come here. But what about the, the, the tree? <laughs> What's going to happen to that? So when you, when you just start your design with the elevation of the single elevation here, everything else just falls into the place. But if you just disregard that element, your design becomes something that is not supposed to be there, actually. It's, it's just, it just comes like from the sky, from, from Mars or something. So just look at those um, already existing, uh, but very uh, innocent and very quiet elements uh, in, the, in the urban realm. Because in the urban areas, we destroyed all types of uh, signs of nature. I mean, we have this wonderful ability of changing everything so much that the space doesn't look like the, that old space anymore. But we have the relics just like that oak tree before. So you, we just need to understand those relics, see them as relics that we can just hold on. So this is another situation of urban heat island effect, um, uh, car oriented design, uh, unfriendly people, unfriendly environments. And uh, so it is just a, uh, just a shame <laughs> for the 21st century city, uh, considering Istanbul is one of the, the biggest metropolitan area on earth and well known and very, very famous. So these kind of frames are total shame for us. So uh, there were, therefore we were commissioned to change this environment into a more of a more sustainable and and inclusive space. So when we look at this picture, there were these sycamore trees, but nobody will even notice that they were there because underneath of these trees were all compacted. Again, we have the situation of asphalt, uh, which is creating this uh, heat uh, effect uh, on the site, generally on the site, but because of the reflection uh, of the heat, uh, the, the, the building was even even more uh, harder. Uh, and we have the bank, for example, ATM machines, and, 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 and then there was nothing else. And, um, and th th there's nothing that you need to just spend extra time to stay here. You will just go in there, do your business, and go out and go somewhere else. And that, that, was, the, that, that was the situation in the area. So we said that we need to change that situation because it's a pity we, we, we have all these nice sycamore trees in the area. And if we just uh, create this strategy to uh, make this area more permeable uh, in terms of microclimate wise, stronger. And uh, if we can just uh, prevent the heat island effect by adding a uh, plantation close to the buildings and by adding uh, pervious materials, surface materials on the surface, or even uh, directing the, the water coming from the asphalt main road uh, into the, uh, to the rain garden or the bioswale that we create, we can just change the 
scenario into a more sustainable way. Um, so the, the water, again, was the essence of this design. How are we going to collect the water? How are we going to infiltrate the water? And while we are doing that, how are we going to support the biodiversity, which will uh, flourish uh, against uh, all the challenges coming with the uh, global warming, um, as well as, um, and how are we going to make this space uh, for people to enjoy? So this is the, the, the picture that is uh, just on the one side explaining the strategy, like improving the uh, pervious surfaces and putting extra vegetation close to buildings and then creating these lines. And then the, the output of the design is also uh, very nice. And then it's well received by the people, the, the beginning of the, the, the end of the construction before the plant materials are inserted. Even with that situation, people just came and they start spending time. Uh, within one month, uh, the people were really enjoying those sycamore trees being underneath that sycamore trees, which was there, which were there, uh, who knows how long before us, before me, for sure. But it, this is the first time they get to make their show in the urban realm, in the human scale. Um, and again, just look at the bank in front of the bank now. It is more pleasurable. People read there, people eat there, people uh, spend time with there. Uh, and people during the summertime, when there are no water inside of these bioswale, people can even sit there and then enjoy this long green corridor, uh, which gives them a real pleasure in a really summer heat, under the summer heat. So, um, so the space makes its own program. So when we were designing this bioswale, we never thought that people will be using it for these purposes. But now when I design the bioswale, I know that depending on the design of this bioswale, this can also work as a seating <laughs> area during the dry times. And this is not only for water, for the flow of the water, but it, it is a a wonderful commodity for flow of people and flow of friendship. And in the winter time, um, and then everything is covered with snow, but no problem because the, the plant materials are native and they are used to these kind of temperatures and weather conditions uh, in the dry summer heat, uh, as well as the harsh uh, winter cold, it really doesn't matter. The next year, they start their show again. Um, so uh, with, with, the, with, with this environment, this is a size scale example that I showed you, more of a human scale and size scale. Uh, but we were able to connect all these green spaces in this whole campus uh, in, with a similar concept and everything was connected and then it was feeding the campus pond, which was a, a pond that, uh, uh, that, that, that that the property utilizes during the summer times for the irrigation of the whole green campus. But then uh, due to the urban development around it uh, on the course of this watershed, uh, this, this pond was drying and dying. So we use this water strategy uh, to support the pond, uh, which is very simple infrastructure, bringing the water, collecting the water from those environments that I showed you with the, through these bioswales and then bringing it down to the lake elevation, lake level, and then just supporting the, the wildlife in the lake where we also utilize this water uh, for the irrigation during the summertime or for some other type of cleaning needs uh, of, the, of the campus. So again, behind this uh, valley, there is this really aggressive urban growth uh, that, that I showed you, like the pictures, like looking west and then there is nothing but the cars and the heat. So now it's, it's all up to us. So this last example um, is the, 
uh, is the uh, industrial site actually. When you look at these pictures, you notice all these cranes. This is a shipyard, uh, the biggest shipyard, uh, biggest one of the biggest industrial areas in Istanbul. Uh, but before this area becomes an industrial, uh, there was this beautiful, ecologically really unique lagoon system here. Uh, but with the ill planning uh, of the 1970s, uh, the, the government has decided to close up the mouth of this uh, area, this lagoon, uh, and then put the, the shipyard to here to block the, the water, uh, the, the seawater coming in. And then there is this river system bringing the fresh water and therefore the mingling of the salty water and the fresh water. We have this unique lagoon system, uh, which uh, migrating birds will enjoy uh, because there is this certain uh, salinity and the pH level uh, where you cannot find on the city, on the sea or on the river system. So this is a unique type of water. We all destroyed it uh, for the sake of industry. Um, but then the years passed by, um, nothing has happened uh, because of the lack of fresh water source, lack of water, the salt, even the salty water, seawater, the lake died. Um, and it was something like this in 2001. It's a pity. And then just look at the how aggressive uh, industrial development over there is again, this was all sea before and they filled the sea and then they just closed the mouth of the lagoon. Um, and then the river system is somewhere just going underneath this road and then underneath the, the shipyard and going directly to the sea and nobody sees that river anymore. So uh, our strategy was uh, multi-dimensional. Uh, uh, first, we started with really heavy GIS and remote sensing analysis because we had to understand what happened to this water. I mean, is there any sign of that water, any sign of that nature that we can start with? Is there a seed that we can use so that we can flourish the whole system again? What, what is to say there? Um, and, and, and then we did a lot of modeling, the water modeling, and how are we going to manage to bring the lagoon uh, into the same water quality? Uh, how much water uh, is, is the bringing the seawater is not a problem. We just, we, the, the, there is the sea and you can just bring it, but where is the, the fresh water that we need to create this lagoon environment? So we just looked at it, how much water we needed, and then we looked at the sources, um, but um, those sources were something like this. Uh, we had this water treatment facility, luckily, very close to our site. Uh, so the water treatment facility was receiving a lot of water from the residential and industrial areas, treating the water. And then when it comes to the level of the, the regulation, acceptable le level of regulation in between those regulation, uh, yeah, uh, the, the digits, they were releasing it underneath this road, main road with the pipe system all the way to the sea uh, without being totally purified, but they, it was purified enough to be released based on the legislation. So we said that, okay, this is a lot of water. In the beginning, I told you that the city has a lot of different sources of water. So this is one source actually, we need to be really creative and smart about it. So we said that, okay, let's just take this one and then create this constructed wetland on the site so that we will purify the water further uh, by utilizing the plant species. Those plants will uh, do the rest of the job. And then the, the water will, in, will go inside of this uh, environment in a much clean way and then constant way because the city keep producing those water. It's a treated water coming every day, millions and millions of tons. It's coming and then it's pity that we are releasing it to the sea after we are done with it. So this is one source. This was main source, although in the modeling, this was not enough. We didn't have enough water to create this ecological process again. So what we needed to 
just utilize the rainwater. We need to harvest rainwater because on the next door, uh, we had the, uh, the shipyard uh, and then that the, the impervious surfaces of the shipyard, the, the roads, anything and everything had a wonderful potential when, you, when it comes to the water, harvesting the water. So we just had to create this uh, corridor, uh, the, the old river corridor again, uh, but this time we will feed the, the, the corridor with the rainwater uh, coming from the surfaces, hard surfaces. Of course, this is a polluted water, but we can just create this vegetated uh, bed uh, so that the vegetation will suck all the pollutants coming from that industrial site and release the water purified or cleared uh, to the system. And then all the uh, other surfaces, uh, permeability in the park and all the hard surfaces were directed also into the, uh, as, as a tertiary water source. So with that scheme, we were able to come close to the, uh, uh, to, to the, uh, the, the level that the, the models are indicating to start the ecological processes back. So, um, and then this is uh, our sections that is showing the, 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 the purification scheme. And, and then sometimes we have the high water level and then that time we have the, uh, the basins or the, uh, the, the areas filled with water and then it's the water is mingling with the plant material. And sometimes we do it with the, those uh, areas, uh, the, the rooms, outdoor rooms does not have water because it's the right time. So with the water, without the water, all the topography of the land is shaped uh, by uh, the, the amount of water between the seasons daily, between day and night. So in, in a, in a uh, temporal scale uh, and versus the, uh, the, the spatial scale uh, was um, processed uh, parallel in the design. Uh, and then there were also, we work with the ornithologists, the bird people, the bird scientists, uh, that uh, what, which one of these migrating birds could come in such pH situation and near situation that we created in the, in the area. So we, we had the target species. So we had, to, we had the purpose of designing for these species also. So this is uh, in 2020, the end of 2020, the construction stages, as you can see over here, huge industrial site next to that. Um, and um, in the 6th of um, December, this is December, 6th of December, uh, this was the site and we have some um, small bridges so that uh, the people can enjoy this water scheme and understand the scheme. Uh, and because experience is a really wonderful way of educating people. So we need, we are creating the experience for people to learn. So in the in the January, which is uh, like actually in, in, in 12th of January, like two weeks later, the rain has started in Istanbul and I had a call from the site saying that, okay, it's working, it's holding the water. And then like this is 12th of January and then within 10 days, this is 22nd of January, in 10 days, we had this incredible thing going on on site. This is not a pool, we didn't spend zillions of money to create these concrete pool environments or seal the land. It is a natural uh, water holding capacity of the design. And uh, we just work with the, the science. And in, uh, in the next month, within like 20 days, we have even more water. So the, the industrial sites, without investing anything to the outlook of the site, becomes part of the park now because of the reflection of the cranes changing when the water rises and then just uh, that, that uh, so it's kind of like a symbiotic relationship uh, between that industrial site versus the nature. Again, the artifice versus nature. And when, when it comes to those small interventions, which is really minimum and very humble ones, um, th th those are the ones uh, that is enough for people to explain and understand how the nature is reacting when you design with it. 
So this is like a sunset time uh, and uh, all the reflection of the shadows of the, the trees just uh, over the water. And this is, this is just the, the rainwater collected from all these horrible surfaces. So instead of seeing the, um, the shipyard industrial area as a really bad and unfortunate uh, decision for the city, uh, as the designers of 21st century, because we cannot change these uh, ill-planned uh, projects, uh, we have to just see them as potentials and we have to use the design as a tool to uh, create them uh, or make them part of the urban uh, habitat. So you might wonder uh, what happened during the summertime when there are no water, <laughs> because in Turkey, in Istanbul, we have the drought starting end of May. So we have a little bit uh, of the water, uh, the, the, the size of this uh, area re re reduced. And in, in July, we had no drop uh, of rain and we had really high, high temperatures of 40 degrees and, and above during the uh, afternoon times. So the, everything evaporates, but still, uh, as of the 17th of August, uh, which is a really long, extensive drought and heat time at the end of it, we still had this situation. Uh, and then we didn't have to utilize any kind of irrigation here. We didn't have to do anything to keep this landscape lush. Uh, we just started the process. And that process just brings the, 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 the nature's design. So it brings the, uh, the, the joy to the site. You just don't have to do or change it all the time. So that with that, again, so the, the, before people were scared of coming there and they had no reason to come there and I don't blame them. But now that is a favorite hangout time. And you can just, you are, you are, you are, your back is turned to the industrial side. And then if you wanna just uh, enjoy the nature, this is a wonderful presence of nature there. And you can just, watch the words and just read your book and just enjoy the sea. This is the connection between sea and, uh, and, and the site and, and all these plant species are, uh, we just needed to start the succession instead of just making all these manicured landscapes. We just inserted few species and then the rest came by the nature and we didn't have to invest, we didn't have to maintain. And then and it, it will probably be, uh, be here uh, for a, hopefully a long future because it's resilient here. And then uh, that brought the people, it's an active urban area now where people take their walk and it doesn't have to be uh, the, the, the nature, but some people like this guy over here, he prefers to just watch the cranes because that's really interesting for them now. It's not an eyesore anymore, but the part of the program. Uh, so it, it, it's the function, it's the part of the program. Now watching the cranes, watching the productivity on the industrial side, which is really fascinating when you think of it. And then the families and so on and so forth and just the dogs and the cats and everybody. So this is my last, um, slide, I would like to close it with the, the, the word of Vandana Shiva. Um, the, the Vandana says that we need to design the world first in our minds. Uh, however we design the world, we will live in it. I mean, if we design it on a sustainable way, we are the ones living inside of it. We need to understand the limits of the earth so that we will understand our limits. So if you know what to preserve, what to use, what to encourage, what not to encourage, uh, then this is the limit for your design. So th 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 there is the input. When we design without limits, uh, we will destroy our well-being. So we need to understand first, this is a hazard for our well-being, uh, let alone the other species on Earth. So this is, of course, a wider concern when it comes to the other species. But when we design with consciousness, 
we will support all these livelihoods on, on Earth. Um, so uh, in, the, uh, in the verge of this climate change and uh, constantly changing world, dealing with uh, all these technological uh, developments and then ecological problems, we just need to be more sensitive about water and then put the water as a center to our design. The rest will come. Thank you very much for listening. And that is all I will say. Thank, Thank you, you, Professor. Okay, sorry. Thank you, Harry. No problem, Thiago. Thank you so much for sharing with us amazing pictures and diagrams, the terrific work you develop here, uh, really inspiring this speech. And I will open the floor for debate. And I have one question, like one first question. Yeah, sure. For you, Harry. Uh, how many backgrounds do you think uh, you need to, to develop a uh, correct landscape projects? Uh, the background of the professions? Yeah, yeah, that kind of like professionals, it. yeah. Okay, Expertise. yeah, well, the, 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 another thing we need to understand is that uh, this is a huge effort which requires a huge team, uh, multidisciplinary team. So as the designers, sometimes we see ourselves as gods, <laughs> but we are not, <laughs> unfortunately. It's a bad news for everybody. We are not. So uh, this, this work requires not only the designers, like the architects, landscape architects, so and so urban designer, but also it requires a, a really strong engineering support, uh, like the like the, the water uh, engineers and uh, mechanical engineers and um, and uh, civil engineers. Uh, even though it looks like a nature-based solution, still in order to create these really sensitive environments, you need some people working on the material science, like for the impervious uh, the pervious. Uh, concrete that, in, that I used in my project. When we when we used that one, uh, actually, we knew that it, it exists because everybody in the United States, in Europe, were utilizing it. And, and then when you look at the projects published in those design magazines, they were always talking about that material. But then when it comes to Turkey, that material didn't exist at that time. We didn't have that. And in order to have that material, we had to spend good amount of dollars <laughs> to bring that material to Turkey. Uh, but we didn't have that luxury. And as far as I know, Brazil doesn't have that luxury either. So we are similar countries, always dealing with economical crises. So we had to develop our own materials. We did our own experiment. This is a design by experiment. We work with the material scientists. And they tried and tried and tried and they, they, they managed in the first round, but then I looked at it as a designer and I just didn't look at the texture of the material. I didn't look at the color of the material. So they have to keep trying until I am pleased with that. But at that certain point, they warned me that if you just keep worrying about this aesthetics, you will lose the property of the penetration, the, the, the water inf infiltration. So I had to compromise. So these multidisciplinary uh, interactions uh, teaches you how to compromise, when to compromise. And there are times that you have to stand as a designer for your design, but there are times that you have to step down and then just let the science and the scientists or the engineers do the work for you. Uh, so it, it, it's, a, it's much more enjoyable if you uh, turn this uh, whole uh, effort uh, endeavor into more of a disciplinary, multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary uh, action. Definitely, it's it's not all about us, but we are the, uh, the, the the chief of the the whole group. I mean, it takes a designer to say that, okay, this is what we are going to do. If you let the the, the engineer just give the side and then just let them do the work. They will never, ever, ever imagine it like this. So the design, everything starts with the designer, but that designer's sincere in, intention when it comes to the ecology, using the ecology not as a um, medium to uh, get commissions and just get the competitions, like, but as a sincere 
uh, action uh, on the ground, on the, on the field um, is, is, is crucial. I mean, we have to be honest to ourselves. It, it is an ethical responsibility for us uh, to start with an ecological uh, pump. Great, Harry. There is a, a great message for our Brazilian colleagues like to rethinking the multidisciplinary approach in the postgraduate yeah. program here. So thank you so much, Thiago. Keep going with our <laughs> uh, event. Please. Oh, thank you, Professor Caio. Uh, really inspira inspirational lecture, Professor Harry Tunke. I think uh, the thing you said at the end of your lecture and right now, I think is uh, really a point of reflection for every one of us. Um, in the, at the end, we're, we're not working alone, but we have to think of these issues like a design issue. It's not just an engineering issue or like designing a device. It's a whole system. It's a system that we're trying to figure out. It's really impressive your work because at the end, there is an amazing design, but it's really an investigation that it's the whole process and really a thorough investigation. Um, I don't have a question right now. In fact, I have many, but I'll, I'll save for the end. I would like to call Roberta, which uh, raised her hand first. Roberta. Mm -hmm. Hi, Professor. Hi again. Hi, <laughs> well, Roberta. Thank you for your presentation. I was delighted about uh, seeing the projects being executed. Here in Brazil, we have some difficulties to see the result of our projects. Uh, but I have a question more about to understand a little bit more of the process of uh, project process. So I'd like to understand if you use previous floating analysis on your park project, uh, because we don't have a lake or something uh, huge about these mm -hmm. in the parks. But I'd like to understand if you use some, something to analyze this and also to analyze the level of the water because we're having here in Brazil a lot of floodings in different re regions that we cannot uh, predict. Um, uh, and so I would like to understand if you, which analysis did you use? And if yes, if you use any analysis, uh, if it was a software or a technological tool of that, and if you can tell me or tell us that which is this software that you use? Sure, sure. Well, it's it's a really good set of questions, Roberta, and I will try to address uh, all, all of them. But if I miss anything, just ask again. Um, so um, this, this whole design process starts with the research, actually. It's a research-based design or knowledge-based design. So we, we've, before we develop the design, we design the research. So that research design is uh, really crucial to start with on, on the right track. Uh, so all of because I am also an uh, academic uh, person. I mean, I I have a professional hat, but I also had the academic hat. So I always value that research aspect, and and I I do really thorough analyses. But in that analysis, um, if this is this, the, the site close to a large water body, it could be a lake, pond, sea, those large areas. Um, so you really look at the, uh, the, the changes in that water system uh, throughout the years and during the year. So there are two different things because the, the landscape changes and we always start our design by looking at if, if it is a large uh, urban scale project, by the way, we always look at how the city has changed. When the city is transforming itself to something bad or good, it really doesn't matter, it's transforming itself, what kind of natural elements are uh, diminished? So we first look at them and then we try to see that transformation. If there are any traces that we can just start working on, we will just hold on to that. But if there are no traces, if everything is all erased and then totally different layer is there, then we start looking at, okay, okay, this is a different system now. This is different than the original one, but how does this system 
operates right now. Then we start looking at the current uh, elements of that operation, like the transportation systems, uh, economical systems, the land use, uh, like the planning decisions, and 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 then like the the, the climate uh, issues still. So what how the place operates that urban huge urban area or the urban itself operates in the in the much more current time. So we looked at, we, we, we always look at that one too. And uh, the, the, during the time that current scenario or the, 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 actual, the, the current situation and the past situations, sometimes they correspond to each other and sometimes it makes sense and sometimes it doesn't make sense. Uh, if it doesn't make sense that you have to just look at uh, the, the, the strong aspects of, of, of the things like, for example, um, if you are optimistic or look at the things in a very positive way, everything is actually a potential. Like look at those cranes. I mean, I show you the old pictures, there were nothing aesthetic about them. But then when you look at them with love, <laughs> they are so beautiful cranes and they can be beautiful and interesting. So it's, it's all up to my design. So just try to see the things in a positive way even though things are looking really ugly, bad, unfunctional, unsustainable, whatever. Just try to see them in a positive way. And, um, and then and after that, when it comes to the technicalities, so this is a, the, 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 these things like looking at the past of the site, looking at the current dynamics of the site and trying to capture what needs to be improved and what we can use in the site. These are the process. But then after this process, the technicality starts. So because you have something in your hands, uh, just making that industrial site more sustainable or more for aesthetically pleasing and ecologically sound, that's something, that's your, your, your idea uh, or your mission. But then the technicality, when the technicality comes, you always have to just look at, um, especially from the water point of view, you can start if you know our GIS. We, for example, just the simple thing you can do is Ike Hydro. I always do just put my line, uh, site on the Ike Ike Hydro modeling. It shows where that water goes, even though it's a developed or an urbanized area. It really doesn't matter. It shows you, an, it's a natural, uh, uh, actually it's a typical process where that water goes because water runs anyway. It, it doesn't have to be natural. I mean, it, it, it's a whole concrete city, but still that water flows somewhere. So just look at those water flows with Ike Arc Hydro if you do not have any kind of uh, complicated uh, softwares or technologies. And uh, if you have means, uh, you can just work uh, head grass and all these like complicated hydrological modeling tools, which is above my head. So that at that point, I always refer to a, an engineer because it's their tool. Uh, for me, it is the archive, archive and then uh, and then some old uh, mapping, <laughs> old style mapping. I will just. Uh, I don't want to tell my age, but <laughs> I'm I'm quite I, I have quite a few years uh, on my uh, on my hands. So um, so this is uh, like the like advanced kind of modeling, uh, like the surface modeling, 3D modeling. Right now, uh, my students are using a lot of Grosshopper, for example, Rhino. All of these are helping you to understand the site in the third dimensional way. Always understand your site in the third dimension, uh, like the flows, where those flows occurs. Uh, those uh, incredible tools uh, are making the, the design process much easier for now, for us. I mean, before it was, um, it was a little bit of a technique, it was a little bit of um, in, in creativity, but more of the intuition of the, of the designer. I mean, if you're an experienced designer, you, you, you had instincts, uh, right instincts to tell you what to do. But uh, right, right now we have the technology, even the students, even the uh, newly graduated our architects, landscape architects can make better decisions thanks to those technologies. Um, so just utilize them, all, all types of CAT, all types of um, GIS softwares, anything and everything is uh, open for, for that. 
uh, and 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 sometimes this new generation uh, is incredible. Uh, my my students are just writing their own codes and then just <laughs> creating their own uh, technologies right now. So it's it's developing so incredibly uh, in the design realm. Yeah, this is above my head too. So coding. Right. Not- but then there are some open sources. I mean, you can look at the USGS uh, web page, and then there are a lot of uh, like the Google 3D, uh, like the, 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 the te- te- Terra set models of some of the, um, the, the imaging companies. So there are a lot of free source data, which gives you directly your uh, area in a third dimensional way. Uh, and then you can make uh, queries depend, based on or the, the queries for the water, uh, the hydrology on the side or urban heat island effects. For example, Professor Silva is using uh, environment uh, to, uh, to, to understand how the, uh, the, the, the vegetation is helping to cool off that urban environment. So it's not only the the software related to uh, water, but also uh, the, the software is helping us to understand the overall climatic, uh, overall uh, weather situation, air situation uh, on the site is helpful. And how these softwares in general are responding to the, the climate change? Uh, because we, we cannot predict everything in 100% uh, sure. accurate. But how they are using this indicator, sure. this this climate change factor mm-hmm. in, in their analysis? Actually, there are a lot of uh, models that is giving you the uh, the output of your design uh, when it comes to the climate change. Like uh, the, for example, Landscape Architecture Foundation's carbon calculator. If you Give the, uh, the the elements uh, entered insert the elements of your design like how much of uh, concrete surfaces or wood surfaces or uh, uh, the stone surfaces you have in your design and how much how many of the trees you have, you utilize in the design uh, and all of these parameters that low design parameters if you enter them into that it gives you your uh, cl- cl- uh, climate report, I mean, like the, the report card when it comes to the cli- being climate positive. So there are a lot of softwares uh, which uh, are uh, showing you and evaluating your design and giving you an insight as a designer, how good you did. And then those softwares, some of them uh, can even suggest uh, the, the, the strategies to improve your score. What else you can do to make this space more sustainable? What else you can do to make this, uh, make your carbon print less? And um, so it's 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 an it's a very uh, incredible uh, arena actually, and uh, uh, like the carbon calculators and climate models, uh, all of them will help you. Uh, before the design, I this is part of my design process. Um, I um, b- b- before I start, I also uh, look at those carbon calculators or uh, the, the models. Uh, I give them the parameters. For example, okay, I want sixty uh, percent of my site being per- permeable, and I want to utilize uh, this many urban trees because I have a budget for that. So there are think that the materials that you can use, uh, it's it's already clear in the beginning of the design stage or you have goals to uh, accomplish. So I, I, I insert those and then before I design anything, uh, the, the, the software tells me how good my design will be in terms of the environmental efficiency, ecological efficiency. And if, if the score is good for me and I'm satisfied, I start following, I, I, start, I try to meet that goal uh, with those uh, arrangements. Uh, right now, uh, we are working, uh, we are actually just starting uh, to create this proposal uh, to see if we can um, um, teach uh, artificial intelligence to make an ecological design. 
because the, in, in the architectural sense, the artificial intelligence is learning to make a, 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 the building program and the, the design. Uh, but when it comes to the urban realm, which has very complex uh, problems and issues, uh, we, we can get help from the, the, the artificial intelligence too. It can learn. Uh, it can learn. You can just it, to teach the, uh, the intelligence uh, with, by feeding it with many different types of ecological projects so that it might even give us this not only the quantitative uh, aspects, of our design, but also the qualitative aspects. Like it can learn and then it can tell us, okay, this is the unique part about your design. So this is, this is a um, really exciting alley. Uh, just, you just need to go in there and, and then try it. <laughs> and also those like big data, internet of things and all these different uh, alternatives uh, are uh, helping us as the designer to Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much, Roberta. Thank you, Roberta and Professor Tanke. It's amazing how uh, this technology can help to make a well-informed decision in such a design research method as yours. I'd like to call it now, uh, Nadia, you were also raising your hand. Hello, everyone. Hello, Hi, Nadia. Professor. Thank you for your lecture. It's very interesting and inspiring as well. Um, throughout uh, even the discussion right now, I get up with some more questions. I have three questions, two sure. quick and one a little bit uh, longer one. So um, this issue, I have technical, but mainly, you know, uh, permeability. Is there a mythology or some specific um, and very professional range that you know engineering very well, or is it possible to grasp and understand for any designer who is doing to understand what is the perfect rate of uh, permeability on the side? Okay, so it just depends on what you are doing with the water, actually. If you're, uh, there are four things actually, Nadia, we can do with the, well, the, the by, by managing the water sustainably on the site. The first thing, which is the, the case and very favorite uh, act, is to harvest them, just to, just collect it to, so that we can reutilize it and use it. The other one is to just um, slow it down, just because in your case, probably you have so much rain, a lot of rain constantly coming and then just, you don't have to just store it because you have too much of it. And uh, in order to prevent the, uh, the, the, the flood and then helping the city to gain time, we just need to reduce the speed of the uh, runoff. So it, it, this is another things you, as a designer that you need to deal with the water. And then the third thing is, um, uh, just the infiltration. Uh, in, 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 in our case, for example, the last case, the industrial area case, uh, the, the urban development is so aggressive that everything is going to the great infrastructure. If it wasn't like that, maybe that infiltration would occur to, to, to the soil underneath the soil, and then it will find its way towards to that water basin, to the lagoon environment naturally, but we cut everything there because of the impervious surfaces and then the gray infrastructure. There was no way for water to infiltrate. Uh, so that infiltration, encouraging the infiltration is an important thing through the permeability. And then the fourth aspect is filtering. Like sometimes uh, your main concern is not collecting it, not slowing it down, not, but, but then the area is so polluted and then there is this industry so hazardous that all you need to do is first to filter it because otherwise it's polluting your groundwater, it's polluting your seas, it's polluting the environment and becoming a total disaster for the many uh, ecosystems on, uh, around them. So those four things, in that case, your priority is uh, filtration, which is purification. So it's just depending on your mission, 
what is there to be done? I mean, what is the utmost important uh, action that we can take by managing that water defines how much of that water needs to be uh, just, 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 just sunk into the ground as a, in, in the form of uh, permeable surfaces, I mean, from the permeable surfaces. If you want to uh, enrich your groundwater and if you want to uh, just um, manage the excessive amount of water in, in your city, it's wise to create all these permeable surfaces so that it will go down. Uh, but in, in our case, most of the time, just sending it all the way down is not a wise decision because we have a more and more drought in Turkey. And then every drop of water counts for us, especially during the summertime, not only in cities, but also mostly for the agricultural production. Like the urban agricultural activities depend on that water. I mean, if we can collect them and then utilize them in the urban agricultural areas, uh, we will have a really sustainable uh, supply of food chain. Especially the COVID situation showed us the importance of decreasing the amount of travel of those food uh, pr the, the products to big cities. So we have to just use that water to boost the urban agriculture in our uh, area. So just depending on what is the, 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 the urban context requires, so if it is a, in the periphery, for example, if it is in the fridge areas where the urban and rural uh, agricultural transition is occurring, maybe just collecting it and using it in the dry times is a good solution. Although the permeability is really high, there is not much concrete there, everything just permeable, if you look at it from that aspect. But then that permeability is not helping us much because we need that water for food production. So it's just depending on the context. Uh, if you are in the, in, in the city where everywhere is so uh, impervious, we have highways and uh, like the skyscrapers and then uh, concrete squares and plazas, everything. So the runoff is so fast that it goes directly into the river system or the gray infrastructure in a really, really quickly. And then that the capacity of that canal uh, cannot handle that immediate volume. So in that case, your priority could be permeability because you're reducing the amount because some of them is just uh, going down, infiltrating, and then the rest is going to the surface and then going, going inside that channels. So just depending on how much infiltration you need and what are you going to do with that? Are you gaining time to prevent the flood? Then do the permeability because that is your strong card that you can play with. Uh, if you are, uh, worried about your groundwater, uh, and if you want to recharge the groundwater, uh, because you need that, and then just permeability is your best bet. Uh, so just it depends on uh, the context, uh, because urban is so complex and there is no one description and uh, prescription. Uh, it just look, look at your case, what your case requires. Uh, actually defines the amount of permeability. But with the situation that you showed at the beginning, it looks like every site needs some permeability. Right, right. right. <laughs> exactly. I mean, just permeability is not only good for the water, but also good for, again, like the heat, uh, biodiversity and uh, amenity, uh, like the aesthetic uh, environment for human beings to feel uh, much better. Uh, so it's, it has uh, a lot of aspects of permeability. Yeah. And the number for this rate is uh, I think an issue of right. some kind of balance. Right. But the second question about a uh, kind of logical connection are you also touched some question of um, maintenance of green areas and uh, water mm -hmm. that uh, is needed. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of a uh, well-known fact that uh, uh, green areas in cities, in dense cities, uh, the soil is quite compacted and uh, in the end, the green areas become 
the same as asphalt and curves. And sure. um, one issue, one solution is to plant some trees with good uh, um, system of roots uh, that um, let water penetrate. Uh, do you mm. touch this question? Do you give some recommendations how municipalities deal with this? Do they mind about this? How do you see green areas in Istanbul or are they good um, enough for permeability and for their mm -hmm. ecological need and mm -hmm. service? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, actually, uh, the maintenance is uh, important as the design itself, because when we are designing it, we always have to think of the maintenance, uh, because that is the, 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 that defines the destiny of our design, actually. I mean, it's not that. I mean, when you finish the design, everything is so new and nobody has used it yet, uh, so it, it looks beautiful. But what happens after 5, 10, 20 years later? Um, so that is that is a really a critical question and very sensitive topic, and it it uh, it has many different uh, aspects. It has an economical aspect, like it could be a burden to the city to keep the site as looking nice as possible all the time. That is an economical issue. It, it is, is also an ecological issue, just that uh, due to that maintenance efforts, we are uh, releasing a lot of carbon and then utilizing a lot of energy. And so that energy and carbon and then performance uh, efficiency is, is also another other aspect of that and then uh, and also during the maintenance if the, it's a high maintenance area or, or it's a high maintenance design during that maintenance practice actually you are cutting the relationship of people with the site because there is a maintenance trap or the, 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 the labor people just doing the work and then you cannot enter it because it's that there's working progress there so you're just actually just cutting all these relationships, the people's relationships, uh, the wildlife's relationships with the site during that maintenance. And you don't have a right to do that, actually. So it's wise to uh, go with the low maintenance as much as possible. But uh, there are things that we cannot control or hard to manage in the urban environment. As you says, the soil compaction is one thing. And then it is millions of people just stepping on your lawn and just enjoying the, the during the festivals like thousands of people <laughs> just cheering up and listening the music laying down reading books how beautiful because this is the the reason you created those spaces but at the end when they are done with that recreation there comes this uh, really sad <laughs> uh, outlook of the of the site, and in in a, in a longer la line at the time, and it becomes more compacted and, and then um, not not so sustainable, of course. Um, I think it comes with the package, but then when you in the beginning of the design stage, if you utilize materials like different mulches as much as possible. And then uh, if you utilize some kind of like uh, geotextile and some stones, uh, that will air the, 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 uh, the, the soil uh, with, the, with the movement of the people. Uh, you are actually kind of like uh, uh, postponing that uh, situation of compactness. And then you, you, you have much longer periods of uh, time that that does not the site does not require maintenance. Um, there are uh, new materials like the geogrid type of materials that we can utilize on the site that is helping the impact of that uh, stepping or, or uh, impact of anything on on, the, on that uh, permeable surfaces. Uh, so we can uh, we can just get help from the new materials uh, and the material science for that. Right, very interesting. And the last question, I hope it won't take a lot of time just about your uh, project, the last, the last that you showed are those uh, flower beds with the uh, beautiful uh, plants. Was this idea to make it perennial and uh, to have to make it um, self-supporting without uh, yeah, some risk planting? Right, right, yeah, well, Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, in, in all of our designs, actually, uh, we, we 
we never used annuals for sure. Uh, we create those uh, perennial beds in the design, uh, but using the perennials like Piet Udol's landscapes uh, is not so common in Turkey. And uh, the, the construction people or the people on the site are really nervous about making those things. They think that it will not work, but they do not have any reason why they believe it that the only explanation is that they are not used to they haven't seen it yet uh, so as a designer i always tell this to my students you have to just keep putting them into your design and one day one construction will guy or the, the, the people will say okay yeah we will do that perennial bed and then you will uh, uh, create this beautiful show of the perennials and then and nobody will be scared of creating those perennial beds in Turkey. It just takes one good example, but we haven't had that example yet. But uh, as a designer, I never give up. And, and in, like the, uh, in a crucial part of my design, I always put the flower beds. Uh, but then when they said, no, we will not do that, we will just use this species instead. Uh, if it is a native species, which doesn't require much water and much maintenance, I go with that. I mean, uh, I, I, I will accept it. Uh, but if it if the, the alternative is the annual plant or any kind of exotic, which is only looking good, in quote unquote, I never accept that one. I mean, I mean, they have to kill me on the site to do that. So I never allowed them to do that. So uh, just um, and the Mediterranean species are so resilient, actually. They are used to having these long, extensive periods of drought, really, really strong summer heat, and uh, not much of the, the soil thickness. That permeability question that you, you, you had, like the Mediterranean landscapes are so rocky. I mean, we have these bedrock really on, close to the surface. We do not have deep soil anyway. So those native species, which is flowering beautifully in the first slides that I showed you, they're all native ones. Um, they, they do not have like really deep roots and they are used to dealing with all these like almost like no water and uh, no, no soil uh, situation because they grow in the, in the rock, rocky situations, the rocky landscapes a lot. And, um, and they have this adaptation, uh, which is going for uh, millions and millions of years uh, in, in the Mediterranean. Uh, that therefore, uh, they are very much resilient when it comes to the heat and also lack of soil. Um, so these are the, the, the species we need to turn our faces on. And in, I'm sure uh, the Brazil might have the similar situation. Like if the compaction, uh, the, the soil depth is problem, just look at the, the species which grows inside of these rock landscape, a rocky landscape on top of the rocks and all that. Uh, and then they, they do not require much soil. So why not adapting them into the urban situation? So they will, they will not mind that compaction probably. Well, here Brazil is in Cerrado, Savannah, so it's hmm. all the country. <laughs> it's very different. Right, right. It's, I'm sure it's so different there. You, you, you have those beautiful plants uh, with large leaves and large flowers and lots of rain. And um, it's, it's, I'm, I, I really wonder, I, I would like to see them in Rio because I've been looking at uh, the Berla Marx's work and then, and all these like Brazilian botanical books and all that stuff. And then even in the magazines, when we see the, the projects from Brazil, I always admire that lush and green uh, atmosphere, uh, but I really would like to see them in person too. And professor, it's a great lesson to learn to look at nature as it is, to think about our design. Sure. To finish, uh, Professor Tonke, I'll ask you a question from YouTube and pass the word to Luisa so you can answer both questions together due to the lateness of our time. In sure. YouTube, Mariana Guimarães, uh, she asked the question about... Uh, 
she asked, you show the cooling solution using mostly shading trees. And she's wondering if cooling solutions such as water fountains and water mists are considered in Turkey. And if they are, in which type of projects or situations do you consider them? And before okay. you can answer that, I'll pass the word to Louisa so she can uh, do her uh, elaborate her questions and then you sure. can answer. I think it will be uh, good to go uh, to see uh, so you can like go to the mm -hmm. ending of the section. All right. So, Louisa. Louisa, yes, go ahead, Louisa. Uh, can you hear me properly? Sure. Okay, well, thank you so much for the lecture. It was really inspiring. And it's really, really nice to see the way that you look uh, in a positive vision as a problem that can uh, turn into an opportunity. So uh, thank you very much. And um, uh, I personally uh, studied um, urban sustainable urbanism in, in the Netherlands during one year. And I thought, well, that's what I want to do with my life. But when I came back to Brazil, I really faced that we normally depend on the government. And uh, here in Brazil, um, it seems like the government is going actually backwards. So um, this is, I think, a struggle that we, we are facing here in Brazil. And uh, as you mentioned, in Turkey, uh, you have some um, problems with budget as well. And in the Netherlands, they uh, normally do PPPs, um, private public partnerships. And I was wondering if uh, in these projects that you presented us today, uh, it was a PPP or you um, relied on the government as well. And I'm sorry if you've mentioned it before and I couldn't uh, be able to absorb it. Thank you very much, Louisa. This is a very nice question and uh, also a very important topic, uh, uh, institutional environment. Uh, so the institutional environment is uh, really important because um, it includes um, the, the decision makers, uh, it includes the, uh, the regulations, the laws uh, that bind, bind in your professional practice. And also it includes the, the, the user uh, and uh, even the norms, the traditions, cultural, behavioral uh, issues, um, and sociology of the things. So institutional environments uh, consist of all these like legal and not so legal, but uh, important uh, aspects of the whole thing. Um, and then, uh, the, therefore, at the beginning of my presentation, I had uh, mentioned the sociopolitical capital. So I said that the capital is important, especially in the countries like Brazil and Turkey, the economy is always important. If you have money, you can do something, but we never have money. <laughs> but uh, so uh, the, the, the sociopolitical capital uh, means that if the, the, the people, the decision makers, as well as the just the regular daily users, the, the, the public, uh, believes and understands and respects uh, the, 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 the issues of the nature. Uh, and, and then they are sensitive about the water, for example. Uh, there is this sociopolitical capital uh, because people believe in the benefits of having uh, such sensitive projects, they will try to find uh, or they will try to open up any kind of doors for you. Like if there is a budget problem, they will try to find some sponsorships and some kind of financial aid, something. I mean, they will just create it because they believe in it. And, uh, and uh, they, they will take the help of the uh, homeowners association and then some uh, uh, NGOs and so on and so forth. I mean, that, everything is possible if you believe in it. So that uh, institutional environment, uh, we have to create that environment. We have to help the creation of that environment, even though uh, it is uh, acting against uh, <laughs> any of the uh, sustainability ideas that we are teaching uh, in our schools. So you, you are learning, we, we learned. Uh, they are always acting against that, um, but still we have to just, we shouldn't give up and we have to 
uh, keep working on that because um, again when it comes to the looking at things in a positive way this is something that we also need to look at positive i mean just seeing the construction side seeing the industrial side positive is one thing uh, but then seeing this institutional environment in a positive way is is also part of that uh, being positive idea just try to see them in a positive way and then try to just communicate and um, I know that it, it's very tiresome and uh, one gets really disappointed after a lot of trials, not a few, but a lot of them I've done it and I haven't succeeded yet. Uh, but then uh, I can show some examples to a beautiful group of Brazilian brilliant students today. I mean, it happens. I don't know when it happened, how it happened, but after 100 trial, if you success one project, and then if that project is implemented only 50%, <laughs> because all of my projects, I mean, when you come to, when, when we can discuss the implementation process, I mean, I just go crazy because only the 60% or half of my project is applied because the rest is cut by the budget, cut by the uh, constructor guy, cut by the, the person who only thinks that, oh, this is not beautiful. It should be like this. <laughs> Who cares? I mean, what your concern is much more uh, meaningful, which is the ecological sound. Uh, so it is. I mean, if, if you are lucky, I mean, you are lucky if if only like the half uh, fifty percent of that work is done. I mean, it's 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 a lifelong process, and you have to dedicate yourself fully to that, and then you should never get discouraged and. Um, uh, and uh, disappointed because that's an easy thing to do that is a normal to be dis uh, discouraged or disappointed but come on you're a, you're a designer just be creative this is why you are here if it was too easy everyone would have been designer or just we didn't have these we didn't need this education or anything like like i mean this this is a challenge which makes the things uh, really exciting. Uh, and and I, I think that when we conquer at the end of this, all these negative things, once you conquer a, a, a project, just one project, the satisfaction a, a Brazilian or the Turkish architects get is, I bet, the 10 times than the American architect, because things are much better, not better or worse, but much different in some geographies of the world. Unfortunately, we are born in very challenging and tough geographies, but we have to live with it. We cannot change it. We will just, if we cannot adapt ourselves and, and if we cannot survive in this geography and we will lose. I mean, we have to adapt. Adaptation doesn't mean that we will sacrifice our, sacrifice our ethics uh, we will sacrifice the essentials of our discipline. We will sacrifice our personal uh, attitude towards uh, being sincere about ecology. So we will, we will. I mean, when we are adapting it, we will not lose those, uh, but we will uh, develop some mechanisms to transmit that message into the decision makers, into the public, into our families, in, into our lives. And um, I hope it answers your question. Uh, that, that the other question was, Tiago, uh, from the YouTube. So, sorry, from Ariana in YouTube. Uh, um, it's about uh, cooling devices. You showed mostly trees. Oh, yeah, the cooling device. OK, and yeah. She has why about fountains in right, this right. strategy. Exactly. Why didn't I have fountains? Well, actually, in Turkey, we used to have a lot of fountains. Uh, but then we noticed that those fountains, uh, the construction of fountains cost us a lot. <laughs> Maintaining those fountains cost us a lot. And uh, keeping the water running uh, cost us a lot. Instead, we change our attitude uh, to create these lush and serene environments rather than a, a, a fountain as a structure. Uh, we 
design the surrounding so that we will feel much more comfortable, climatically comfortable. Um, and, and then that time we noticed that our water budget or the, the, uh, the water bill reduced significantly. That time we noticed that uh, we don't have to worry about the water availability of the water, provision of the water during the dry times because we didn't rely our design on the fountain. Um, so th therefore, um, we just um, skip that uh, in, 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 in the uh, last 10 years, although there are designers, Turkish designers heavily putting large pools and huge waterfalls, artificial waterfalls and creating those Las Vegas looking landscapes, uh, still doing that. Um, I just don't do it. I mean, I, 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 I salute them and I, it, uh, I'm, I'm respectful to their work, but I just don't do it because uh, I know that we need to be more sensitive about it. In Turkish condition, again, I'm not saying it's for Brazil or I'm not saying it anywhere else, but considering that Turkey is becoming more and more arid, uh, the, the it's getting more more warmer, which was already so hot, and it's it's, it's even hotter now. And also, uh, the water resources are shrinking. Uh, we were not even able to uh, defeat the city, uh, the urban populations. Uh, last year, it was horrible. It was total disasters, and we were really really scared of being without water. The agricultural production uh, reduced to half. And uh, the villagers don't do agriculture anymore because they do not have water. And then the cost of water, when they the, the provision of the water is possible, uh, the, the amount of the, the, the water bill uh, is not worth growing anything. So we, we, we have totally different context. And therefore, um, those pools and fountains has to be uh, utilized in the design depending on the condition. I mean, if it is, of course, like a summer camp, I mean, of course you have to provide a pool or fountain for people, uh, but not for every single uh, uh, corner in the city. So it just depend on, depending on the, the, the situation again. I think the design is so unique to the geography and the conditions and the realities of that geography. Thank you, Professor. It's an excellent point. Really, we got to learn from our context, our situation, our geography. Uh, I'd like to thank you once again, Professor uh, Heidi uh, Tunke. Uh, it was a really inspiring lecture. I think uh, not only the technical uh, solutions that you can uh, show us, but your sensitivity or to the environment and to the social uh, issues are really yeah, really impressive. I think it's inspired to every one of us uh, who thinks that we should try to solve the problems, but it's not really a matter of technical problems. It's political, it's social, it's cultural, mm -hmm. and really a matter of design. Uh, before finishing, I would like to invite Professor Caio Silva to his last words. Oh, thank you, Thiago. I just to say hello to Mariana. Mariana uh, is part of the our lab with Professor Garrett Doherty at Harvard. I think oh. Harry knows Mariana. And yeah. uh, I'm really honored, Heidi, you accepted my invitation to be here, like in Brazil virtually, and mm -hmm. your lecture and your words and drawings and diagrams and your mm -hmm. vision uh, about landscape is really inspiring. And thanks again. And thanks our audience. And I, I'd like to, to finish our section for today. And Thiago, please invite everyone to the next lecture. Sure. OK, um, next week, we'll have Professor uh, Eric Wolf from the RMIT Australian talking about an issue that somehow uh, correlated to Professor Stenke lecture. It's about urbanism and nature-based solutions. There's a lot of about, uh, talk about also water sensitive design and the social aspect of it. 
So I think it will be a nice complementation to this lecture of Professor Tenke. Great. Thank you again, Harry. It's Thank you very much. Uh, it's nice definitely a pleasure. And on the chat box, I wrote uh, the the communication link uh, and thank you to everybody for listening uh, with great attention bye bye <laughs> bye bye have a nice weekend and trip hi see you, you soon too. thank you very much